I could do whatever's thrown at me. And if I can't, I'm willing to learn. And that's the thing about me is I'm always willing to learn. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and here we are with episode 196. In this episode, we hear from Miss Caitlin Deschel, a world champion martial arts competitor turned actress known for her athleticism and stunt work. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on traditional martial arts twice every week. Welcome, I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to all you returning listeners, and welcome to the new listeners out there. We designed our no-sweat tees to be the perfect layer for under your martial arts uniform, but they work just as well around town or in the gym. Lightweight, comfortable polyester and our Never Settle slogan will make this your favorite shirt. We build them to last, so you'll be wearing yours for a long time. Find them and the rest of our great stuff at whistlekick.com. When it comes to stunts and Hollywood, there are a number of names that many martial artists recognize. Most of that name recognition comes from their time on screen, though. We have far fewer individuals we look to and call ours, people who share stories similar to ours, competitors, people who have trained for years, decades. Today's guest is one of those exceptions. Competing worldwide on the Nazca circuit led Miss Caitlin Deschel to a Jackie Chan movie and ultimately a career. We get to go behind the curtain with her today and find out not only how that happened, but why it's been the realization of a dream. Miss Deschel, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for coming on the show. Been looking forward to this. As I was telling you, listeners, as I was telling Miss Shell, she for quite a few months now has been the most requested guest that we haven't managed to coordinate, but you know, it took us a little bit of time, but we're here we are now. And I'm looking forward to I'm learning more about so you. Excited. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Even here I was like the most requested next to some of the amazing people that you know, you've interviewed on the show. I'm I'm so honored. So thank you. <laughs> and thank you to all the fans, I guess, out there too, who have been requesting me. It, you know, it's, it's cool. You are one of a, of a handful that, you know, we get to look at as martial artists that came out of the competitive circuit. You know, we know your, your chops, you know, we know your skills inside the ring. Uh, you know, and, and some of us have, followed you for years and and now you've made the transition you're on the screen you know doing big things headed for even bigger things i have no doubt but there aren't a whole lot of you that we get to look at in that way and and it's just great and i think that that's why fans have you know the listeners of this show have have really taken you yeah well thank you i mean it's definitely been an experience and my my martial arts career and competing all of those years have definitely given me the opportunities that, you know, I do have out in the industry now. So, I mean, I'm, I'm greatly thankful for all of that and all the fans who do support me and do, you know, enjoy watching the journey because it's definitely been a fun one for me. So thank you to all of you and even you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you. You get to put me in both of those categories. I am, I am a fan as, as well as the, <laughs> the guy on the other side of the microphone. <laughs> no worries. Regardless of how much we've seen of you, be it, you know, on, on YouTube or, um, you know, TV or movies or whatever it is, you've got a starting point. And we found that that's kind of the, the best way to get started on the show is to roll back to the very beginning. How did you get going as a martial artist? So I started martial arts when I was six years old. Um, My mom's dad actually suggested it more so for the self-defense side of things. Um, And, you know, just being a a young girl and eventually being, you know, a teenager and a female and just having that um, background behind me to be able to defend myself if I ever had to. And, um, you know, I mean, of course, being six years old, I was like, yeah, sure. Put me in whatever you want. So I found this um, martial arts school. I was born in Miami, so was living there. And they put me in and I started going to classes. And I I just really, I really had a thing for it. I enjoyed it. It was fun. It was a challenge. And um, then my first instructor, who was Rick Begley, his son, Nick Begley, was competing on on NASCA. And when I kind of saw him and what he was doing and what he was training for, I was like, whoa, that is what I want to do next. 
so that's pretty much kind of what I jumped right into. You know, I started learning the tricks. I started learning the weapons and, um, it was just such like a, it was like an eye opening experience to be able to not only do classes, but then to be training for something and to be, you know, to have goals to look forward to and work at. And I fell in love. I mean, I was starting to go six days a week. You know, I would go to school, I'd come home, I'd try to do my homework, and then I would run right there. And um, yeah, it was <laughs> that was history from there. I, um, you know, I learned how to do every weapon, um, which I'm forever thankful that my instructor made me do that because now it's come in so much handy, you know, through my martial arts career and then especially in the industry. And um, but my first weapon was actually the Chinese fan. So I did double fan as a little girl that was kind of cute <laughs> but then nobody really understood it so then I was like uh then as I got older I was like I think I need to switch to something a little bit more fierce you know so I did comma for a very short time and then from then you know as you know I do swords so I switched over and that just became the weapon like that and it literally is my favorite weapon like if you give me a choice of course that's the first thing I'm gonna pick up so um, yeah. And then, you know, so I trained, um, I trained in Miami primarily with him and I give him a lot of credit to my career and, you know, to the martial artist I became, but then I also have a black belt in two other styles. So the first one was Chinese tempo. Then the second one is uh Japanese gojuru. And then the third one is Taekwondo. So it's kind of given me like a, a little bit of a broad range and, you know, the different types of martial arts and what they encompass. But, um, yeah, so it's, that's, that's pretty much where I started. And then, you know, into my competing career. How did you get going with Chinese Kempo and then move into Goju and in, in Taekwondo? How did, how did that all work? Yeah. So the transition between all the black belts was just actually other, you know, friends who own schools in different places I went and trained. Um, my first instructor had eventually ended up, um, kind of closing down his school you know, he was having some issues here and there. And I was like, well, I need somewhere to train. So um, I had found this Gojuru school, which was a, another girl that I used to compete against, uh, Jenny Espina, and kind of just started training there. And then I was like, well, if I'm going to train here, like, I don't want to feel like the odd man out. I was like, let me learn. Let, like, let me learn the forms. Let me learn the style. And then by that point, I mean, you might as well test. <laughs> You know, I mean, I was I was there five, six days a week as well. So, you know, you want to be a part of the family and the structure and not just always feel like, oh, well, you were too cool for school to like come in and be a part of us. So, yeah, so that was how I ended up with that. And then for Taekwondo is actually through the ATA and Jesse Isaacs owned a school in Miami and he wanted to bring in XMA at the time through my chat. And I was on his team and I was kind of bringing that up with him. And Mr. Isaacs was like, oh, well, I need someone to teach this. But technically, you know, in their style and their curriculum and everything else, you can't really be involved or teach without being a part of them. So I was like, well, let's do it. Teach me all the forms. Teach me the form I need for my belt rank. And then let's go from there. So I did that. I tested in and started teaching for him as well with XMA and starting the program. And yeah, so that's how over my years I've accumulated three black belts. <laughs> <laughs> cool. You know, my, my favorite part in hearing you talk about this is is not the number of black belts you have, but your your desire to learn the material. I think there's a lot of perception out there that those that end up on the competitive circuit. And, and let's be honest, a circuit like NASCA is known for not necessarily having the, the, the deepest ranks of folks that focused on traditional elements, right? Of I, course. I, I, I think, I think we can, we can all admit that NASCA competitions have a bit more flash than some of your other competitions. And for some, that's not well, their cup of tea. And they'll often point at that and say, those aren't real martial artists. And listeners and, and anybody out there that is critical of that, I, I just want you to roll back and listen to the last 10 minutes and the the parts where you're saying, I want to learn the forms. I don't want to just be here to train. I want to do it right. Yeah, no, I definitely agree because, 
you know, as much of it is about the flash and the everything else, it is about the basics. And that's what I've always been rooted in. And if you see some of my students who still compete on the circuit, you know, it's, it's very rooted in martial arts. And, and if they ask me like, Hey, can I put this, you know, throw my weapon in the form or, Hey, can I go from this trick into this trick? I'm like, I stop them. And I'm like, where's the martial arts? Please, please tell me you're not in a trick circle or a trick session. You're in a form. This is a fight. So show me where the martial arts and where the practicality comes into it. And then we can talk about putting it in. And then they think about it and they're like, oh yeah, that's right. And I'm like, yeah. And I, and I don't mind it. Like I, you know, saying, saying that I don't want people to come back and say, oh, well, you know, you don't support that because no, I have thrown my sword in competition. I do the flips as well. But if you also look at my forms, the basics are there and that's what, that's what matters. Like throwing a sidekick to me is still important because you find a lot of martial artists who can't kick and you're like, wait, well, how did you get a black belt <laughs> when you don't know how to throw a proper sidekick, you know? So yeah, forever in me will be my basics and my tr just traditional karate. As much as I love the flips, like that's my, that's my, you know, my ground. It's where it yeah. keeps me and that's where I started. So I'll always revert back to that first. Well, it's great to hear that you see them as fundamental. You know, they are called basics for a reason. <laughs> definitely right yeah for a reason that's where you start those are yeah. your basics <laughs> and and i've certainly seen people in competition who as you say can't throw a sidekick but will you know throw backflips and hurl their weapons and it just there's just yeah, something about no, it it definitely. doesn't look right you can tell yeah well it's good i'm glad i'm glad you tell and i i hope it comes more back full circle to the basics again, because I feel like at one point it did get a little, did get a little lost in the world of, you know, how many times can you spin while you throw your weapon in the air? Um, but, you know, I do encourage a lot of the kids who do compete nowadays to still remember that they are martial artists and, you know, the basics are what is the most important thing. Yeah. Here on the show, we tell a lot of stories and, you know, you told us a little bit there at the beginning, I'm sure with all of your traveling You've got a ton of great stories, but if somebody was to, you know, hold you down and put a sword to your, your head and say, tell us your best martial arts story, what would you tell them? Wow, that you're right. There, there are a lot of stories <laughs> throughout the years, um, but I probably have to say the most, the, the most and the best exciting and everything else kind of story that I would have is when I was competing, you know, on the circuit, I would say the U S open was probably one of my favorite tournaments, just, you know, the, the level that it held and it being on ESPN, there was just a lot there. That was always a, a hectic and just fun and thrilling weekend. But, um, I remember winning, uh, the ISKA form and weapons title on stage one year. And, um, it, I guess this is going to lead into another story, stories and stories, <laughs> Please. but I remember um, getting an email um, from someone involved in Jackie Chan's team. And it was the shortest, just most brief email that came through my website and just said like, Hey, would you be interested in being in a Jackie Chan film? And that was the end. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is funny. Like someone's just messing with me, but always, of course, I will write, write back, you know, respectfully. And I was like, hi, yes, you know, gosh, that would be an honor. Thank you so much. Please, you know, give me more information. So then they wrote back, it was kind of, you know, wasn't too much the communication. And I was just like, ah, eh, you know, disappointing, but hey, you know, maybe the opportunity will come at some point, right? Then I get an email about six months later. And it said, okay, pretty much said, we're ready to go. We're ready to book your tickets to Beijing. Are you ready? And I was like, ready? I'm like, ready for what? <laughs> and they were like, yep, but we're, we're filming. We're ready to book you to bring you out, blah, blah, blah. Let's talk detail details. And I was like, this is really, ha this, this may actually really happen. And I was like, yeah, sure. So, you know, me, I'm going back and forth. I'm writing, I'm excited. And Next thing you know, I had a ticket to Beijing. I knew I was doing one of Jackie Chan's films. I don't believe I knew the name of it. 
I had no idea what I was doing on the film, but to me, it didn't matter. You know, I mean, in the martial arts world and being a martial, excuse me, being a martial artist, he is a legend. So whatever you wanted me to do, (laughs) I was going to do. So got on the plane, went to Beijing, landed. I was so jet lagged. I was so tired. I think I was maybe about 18 at the time. And I got off the plane and, you know, nobody speaks English really, you know, it's all Mandarin. So there wasn't a lot of communication when I got there. I was just kind of being, you know, tossed from this person in production to this person. Oh, go see them. Oh, you know, fill out this form. And I was just like, it was a whirlwind. So went to sleep that night and I was like, wow, I have no idea what to expect tomorrow. And I got to set. I got into hair and makeup first day again so I have no idea what I'm doing and Jackie walks in the room and he just like looks over at me half asleep it's like five o'clock in the morning and he's like he looks over at me and he you know puts his hand out and says hi I'm Jackie Chan I was like (laughs) I was like hello sir (laughs) yes I know who you are very nice to meet you he sat there next to me and um we just got hair and makeup done And then someone hands me a script and they're like, all right, you ready? And I was like, "Uh, um, ready for what? They're like, oh, we have lines. We, um, here's your character. And I was like, character. I was like, whoa, I have a character in a Jackie Chan film. Okay. (laughs) So my first day on set was shooting dialogue with Jackie Chan. (laughs) (laughs) Then I later came to find out I had my own fight scene against you know his girl counterpart because I was I guess quote unquote bad even though you know there's never anyone necessarily bad in a Jackie Chan film but I wasn't on his side let's just say and um yeah so then I ended up you know having dialogue with him in the film and ended up having you know my own fight scene so I definitely think you know saying it being my you know best martial arts story I would say it would definitely have to be that because he found me by watching that ESPN show. He said that he, and he told me the story himself. Cause he asked me, he was like, I, I asked him, how did you find me? Like, how did that even come about? And he was like, I was sitting in the United States, just watching some TV one day and martial arts came on the TV. So of course he stopped and he, and I came up on screen. He watched my performance, but he missed my name. So he was like, how am I going to find this girl? So he kept sitting there and watching and watching. And then, of course, I came up again and he snapped. He was sitting there, he said, in front of the TV with his phone, just waiting. And he said, when my name came up, he took a picture. He sent it to his producers and said, find this girl. So that would probably have to be (laughs) my greatest martial arts story (laughs) ever. Um. I, I'm wondering because I'm trying to put myself in your place there. Did did you have a moment, you know, where, where you just said it's all downhill from here? Because that just oh. seems, you know, to to have have Jackie Chan reach out to you just because he was that impressed with you, and for them to have so much confidence in you and your abilities that they don't even feed you your lines ahead of time, they don't even tell you your role. They just say, come on out, because they I'm assuming they believed you could do it. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, it's crazy when, when I think back and, and I tell this story, it's just like, it's wowing to me because I'm like, who knows? Like, what if I wasn't able to speak well? What if I wasn't able to pull off the fight scene he wanted? What You know, there's so many what ifs. And, you know, I think just my martial arts had helped me so much and just so many other areas of my life. And and one, just being, you know, confident in my skill and knowing and just taking what I've learned all those years and all the, you know, different styles and, you know, my instructors and just putting that all into one and saying, you know, I could do whatever's thrown at me. And if I can't, I'm willing to learn. And that's the thing about me is I'm always willing to learn. You know, I don't think I know everything. I don't think I'm, you know, some huge master who never needs to be told anything. Like I will always try to take a tip here and there from somebody, because I feel like if you do that, you just learn so much more. And then you're so much better off prepared for when you are thrown into a situation like this, when you don't know what you're necessarily going to be doing, but you find a way to make it work and, you know, to push through it. 
What was the name of that movie? Chinese Zodiac. Okay. And I am in some fierce looking gold shorts. Ooh. So you won't miss me. <laughs> fierce looking gold shorts. Okay. Well, I, I Yeah. You know, I feel like I've seen that one because it definitely rings a bell. You might have. And and I I may have seen you and just not realized it was you. So I'm gonna go back. That will that will be part of this week's T V time. Um, yes, definitely. So it's a good one. There are out. some crazy stunts that he does in it. So, I mean, I would say our scene was actually one of the best and probably the opening scene. And I'm not going to tell you about it because I don't want to ruin it, no, but don't. he is, he is crazy and it's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> cool. Awesome. That was a great story. And, you know, we're starting Thank to you. get a better, oh, you're welcome. We're starting to get a better sense of, of you and who you are. And, and there's a lot going on kind of in between the things that you're saying that I'm sure listeners are, are picking up on it as I am. Obviously martial arts is a, a big part of your life, maybe even the biggest part of your life, but mm -hmm. is there room for anything else? Do you have any hobbies? Is there anything else that makes you tick? Yeah. You know, I mean, of course, um, you know, as much as I, as I am a martial artist and that's all I do and train and, you know, everything else. I, I am still, I do try to still be the most normal person I can be <laughs> and just have a life and have fun and have friends. And, you know, I'm, I'm super, super close with my family. Like they are my rock. And, um, so as much as I can travel and see them and go home, I do. It's actually just what I did last week. I went home and, um, was there for my mom for mother's day. And, um, so I love that. Um, number two would probably be working out. It's just something that I think has grown off my martial arts. And as much as I do like going to, you know, the dojo and training, you know, my skill, I, I love to be in the gym. I love just like a good run, um, some weights, some uh, hit cardio workouts. I just really like to mix it up just to keep me excited and, you know, going. And then, of course, that helps my martial arts. So it's like, you know, kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> yeah. And then um, lastly, I, I guess I would say acting. Like I, you know, when I moved out here, I originally had just kind of wanted to do stunts. And acting was always in the back of my mind. But I was never a theater major. You know, I never took acting classes when I was young. So I was like, ah, maybe that's a long shot, you know. But then funny enough, I have this character in Chinese Zodiac. And once I did that and did my own fight scene, I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be a female Jackie Chan. I want to be a female Tom Cruise. Like, be the character and do my own son. Like, that is my dream job. So right now, I've kind of, you know, I'm obviously still doing stunt work. You know, I'm, I'm heading out to a job shortly in Vancouver. I just did Wonder Woman. Um, but you know, I am in acting class and I am definitely pursuing that just as heavy because it is something that I really enjoy. And actually it's a really good challenge for me just mentally because my career and my life has been so physical and, you know, also mental because I, you know, the determination and the, the focus and stuff like that. But acting makes me kind of have to really expand my mind so it's kind of like using a different muscle. So for me, it's very intriguing and um, I've actually really have grown a like to it lately. So yeah, I would say those are my three things, family, working out and acting. Mm. What's the hardest part about acting for you? Mm. Letting go, just being open and immersing myself into the character I'm playing, because I think I think through all the years of martial arts, I've taught myself to be so guarded and so strong and so um, resilient to the outside, you know, then that's how we're taught. I'm sure, you know, you, you see some, you know, resemblance there also. And you, you know, when you're acting, you have to almost be the opposite. You have to be open and you have to be vulnerable and, you know, you have to, there's just a lot more feeling to it. And it's just different. Like there is all of that in the martial arts sense, but it's definitely a lot stronger, you know, of an attitude in that than there is necessarily in the acting. So yeah, I would definitely say it is tough, but like I say, it opens me into a new, a new way of being kind of and a new way of seeing myself. So I do learn a lot in that sense as well, which is great. Right on. 
we've heard a lot of high points so far in, in the bit of the conversation we've had so far. Mm -hmm. But I can't imagine life is all high points. I'm sure there's somewhere along the way things got difficult. I'd of like you course. to, yeah, like, I'd yeah, like you to think, us, think about uh, a tough time in your life and how you were able to lean on your martial arts to get past it. Yeah, no, definitely. Of course, there's always the highs and lows in life. There is no one person who lives at a high 100% of the time. I think that's impossible. So, yeah, I mean, I would say maybe, you know, a low point where martial arts definitely helped me was um, at one point, and uh, forgive me for not knowing the exact age, but I want to say I was in maybe sixth grade. And there got to a point in my training where, you know, my ankle was always hurt, it was always hurting. Like I'd finish, you know, practice at the end of the night and I would just complain to my dad and be like, God, dad, like, it hurts. Like I can't walk. I can't do another flip. I can't do another form, you know? And, and it was hard. And especially being young, like it's, it's weird to know what like being hurt is young, you know? So it like kind of, it would get me down and I would, you know, not want to train because I didn't want to be in pain per se. So, you know, my dad used to take me to clinics and, you know, they would just be like, Oh, you know, you got like a sprain, just ice it up and you'll be good. Right. So after I had done that maybe three, four, five times, I was like, I was at a point to where I was like, dad, I like, I can't anymore. I'm, I'm something is wrong, you know? So we went to an orthopedic surgeon and I remember having like MRIs, x-rays, the whole nine done. And the, I just remember the doctor walking back into the room and just looking at me and being like, and how long has this been happening? And I was like, I don't know, maybe a year or two. I, like, I've lost track at this point, you know? And he was like, yep, well, I can definitely see that. Um, you completely broke the bone off the bottom of your ankle. Your ligaments are all torn. Like, you have bone fragments. Pretty much everything that could have been wrong was wrong. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, what am I, what am I going to do? Like, I had a tournament, I think, within five weeks that like, I don't remember exactly which one it was, but it was something that I needed to be at. But this guy was the doctor was like, you need surgery, like, we need to completely reconstruct what is going on in your ankle. Um, so I was like, okay, I mean, I don't mind, but I need to recover as fast as possible, because I will be at this tournament. And the doctor just looked at us like we were crazy. He was like, there's just no way. I was like, okay. So I think I literally went into surgery in the next few days. Um, they took bone fragments out. They re tried to reattach my ligaments the best they could. I mean, I had um, scar tissue. I had all kinds of stuff because obviously, you know, your body tries to heal when something is wrong. So that's what it had been doing all these years. And yeah, so I, I had surgery and I was completely taken out. I had a cast up to my knee you know, um, I was on crutches, you know, in school, I remember hobbling around and it just being so difficult. And then, you know, I couldn't train the way I had to, or I wanted to, but I knew that I had this tournament coming. So as I finally got better, you know, took the cast off, I went right into physical therapy and I told them, I was like, I have like three or four weeks to recover, like go <laughs> do whatever you need to do. Make me do whatever exercises I need to do. I need to be as close to 100% as I can. So I think through what martial arts had kind of taught me was, you know, it gave me that, that, that drive and the determination and the willingness to work through the pain. Because I mean, of course, after having surgery, I mean, I lost all the muscle in my right leg, because I couldn't really use it. Um, you know, so imagine having one completely strong, healthy leg and then one not so great leg. And, you know, I, I land a lot of tricks on my right foot, my 540, my gainer, all the tricks that I was primarily doing at that time as a kid, I had lost that, that muscle. So, um, yeah, so I think just, you know, once I finally started going through therapy again, I was training again. And, you know, I think I just, through what I had been through in the past in my training, it gave me just the confidence to, to get back into it and push through it and know that I had this tournament coming and I had no choice. You know, I had to put my mind to it. I had to prepare 
you know, the best that I could and, and, and go win, <laughs> you know, like have that willingness to, even though I know I'm maybe not at a hundred percent, still get as close as I can and just, and be ready. So I did, I competed, um, at that tournament four weeks later with an ankle brace. So if you ever see pictures of me as a kid wearing an ankle brace, now everyone knows that story. I had full reconstructive surgery and got up on stage and competed anyway. So yeah, I was, I would definitely say that was one of the, the lower, harder points of my career at one, at, you know, at one time in my life. Have you reflected on the idea that you, you completely sheared the bottom part of your ankle and you were still yeah, you not know, only just moving around, <laughs> but active and, and doing things that most people can't do with all of their bones intact? I mean, did, yeah. that, that's the part that struck me as you're telling that story. <laughs> you know what? It's funny is that like, I've learned to deal with pain, which is a good thing, but a bad thing. Because obviously, like you say, you're like, um, wow, Caitlin, that's actually really not normal. Like something's wrong with you. And it's like, yeah, probably something kind of is, but I just, I learned to, to embrace it and to know that it's not going to be all, you know, flowers and pretty and fun and happy, you know, like there's long hours of training and sweating and getting beat up. And that actually transfers right into, you know, my stunt industry out here and what I do because shooting for Wonder Woman, we shot for eight months, including prep and shooting. And I worked six days a week for eight months trained twice a day, rehearsed whatever I wasn't working out in a gym. And I think through my karate years, it kind of got me to that mindset to like, keep pushing until someone says, you know, you're off the clock or you're done. Even then you're not really done. Like someone somewhere is training harder to beat you or to be in your place. So you have to always keep that in mind and just always push regardless of the circumstances. Cause don't get me wrong. There are plenty of days when I wake up and I'm like, I'm so sore that I could hardly walk, but I'm like, find a way, find something to do that can still benefit you. Even if it's stretching, even if it's going and taking a yoga class, just something that moves you forward. And I think definitely martial arts has kept my mindset like that in regards to whatever I do, whether it's my, you know, my career, my relationships, my, you know, whatever, I always have that mindset that I have to move forward and keep working hard. So, yeah. Excellent advice for everyone, for sure. Thank you. You've had the opportunity to to train with, I mean, just utterly amazing people, best of the best, and probably a, a deeper list than most martial artists will, will have in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. If I asked you to pick out one of them, who was the most influential on your martial arts career, however you want to define that, who would that be? You know, crazy enough, as this, as this may sound to a lot of people and a lot of, you know, viewers and fans, I'm honestly going to say my dad. Um, my dad was never a martial artist. Uh, he didn't, you know, no one in my family did martial arts at all. Not even, I don't even want to say at my level, but just period. And from day one, he was always by my side in the karate school. He never was one of those parents that just dropped me off and said, Hey, have fun. Or, you know, come, come to one belt testing. You know, he was there every day, every hour that I trained and he, he learned pretty much as I learned. And like I said, he's never taken a martial arts class himself. He's not a black belt. But he can tell you every little thing you do wrong when he watches it. It is absolutely incredible. Like, if you do a sidekick, he's like, why isn't your bottom foot pivoted? He's like, where's your knife edge? If you do a chop punch, he's like, why is your hand not chambered? If you do, you know, a, a kick, he's like, uh, like a kick flip. He's like, why didn't you kick your leg higher? You would have gotten more height and that would have saved your landing. And you're just like, whoa. <laughs> Like, I, and then people, people see it, you know, and especially through my career, they started watching and they're like, Oh, okay, cool. Like what degree is your dad? <laughs> and I'm like, he actually doesn't have one, but he's just, 
he's so, you know, he was so watchful all those years and he picked up on it. So then at one point, you know, when I started training myself and, you know, making my own forms to where I almost didn't have a coach where I was my own coach, he was my coach. And, you know, I would do a form and I would record it and take it home and be like, Hey dad, you know, cause at this point I can drive, I can go train on my own. He's at work. You know, so I come home, Hey dad, you know, what did you think about this form? And he was always honest with me. It was never one of those relationships where he would try to like, you know, toot my horn and be like, Oh, Caitlin, that was amazing. You know, he was like, no, you need to fix this, this, and this, this is looking great, good improvement. And we would just go back and forth. And we had this relationship to where he would push me and he would, he would make me better because there'd be times where I'd be like, Oh, I don't know if I'm confident enough to throw that. And he's like, no, go, go do it a hundred times. If you have to figure it out, you're, it looks amazing. Get it done. And he would kind of be that push for me that helped progress my career, you know, and my competitive career. And, you know, of course, we would have times where we would collide, you know, no, no relationship when you get to that is perfect, because there are little bickers here and there. But um, he definitely pushed me always, whether I had a, a normal martial arts instructor or not to be that much better. Like there was no like, oh, cool, second place this time, like, we can get it next. I was like, no, we got home from a tournament. You got into the gym, you fixed the form, you made it better. And then you got ready for the next one. So, I mean, I'm forever thankful for him and all the time and the hours and the traveling he did with me. Like he was at every tournament until I was about 18. And even after 18, he was like, do you still want me to travel with you? And I was like, yeah, of course. I'm like, who's going to play my music? Who's going to be there to like cheer me, you know, cheer me on and blah, blah, blah. So he was still traveling with me a little bit till, you know, even after 18. And um, it's actually crazy that I say that because when I am actually at a tournament and I, let's say like ESPN, for example, right, you're on stage, thousands of people in the crowd, you got the camera in front of you and I don't hear very much when I compete. I kind of go into this zone and I, I I could remember and I like, I'm just like, it's replaying in my mind right now, but I can hear him when he yells out or says something or says push or go or finish strong. It's like the one thing that I can hear in all the madness and all the chaos at that moment. And it's just, it's amazing because it's just, it's such a, a bond we've created over the years. And like I said, in the beginning, you know, of this, my family is like, they're like my best friends, like my mom, dad, and brother, they are so close to me. So it's like to be able to have them so attached to my, my martial arts career. And even now my, you know, career out here in, you know, Los Angeles is just such a blessing because I know that I always have the support of them so I know my dad will listen to this at one point, and I just want to tell him that I love him and thank you. <laughs> well, shout out to your dad and all the martial arts parents yeah. out there. I, you know, my, my mom did the same things for me that your dad did for you. She was she was my coach, That's and right. and it's yeah, it's it takes a, a special parent to push their kid in in the right way and, and set them up for success, and clearly your dad did that for you. So that's awesome. And, and for everybody out there listening that either has a kid that they're pushing in that way or, or somebody that was pushed in that way, you know, recognize that special bond and, and make sure you, you say thank you. Yeah, definitely. All the parents out there. I mean, that's, that's a bond that you have with your kids forever. And I hope I get mm. that opportunity that if my child wants to do martial arts or whatever sport they pick, you know, that, I will always remember, you know, what my dad did and how he was there for me. And, you know, I, it, it's taught me great things because I want to be that, you know, for my children. So, yeah. yeah. Now, if you had the chance to train with someone that you haven't from anywhere in time, anywhere in the world, any martial art, who would you want to train with? Wow. That's a tough one. Um, you know, I mean, through my martial arts career, there have been so many people that, like you said, I've fortunately been able to train with and to work with. Um, 
you know, any of the martial arts legends that are out there, I mean, I would love to train. And there, there are, you know, quite a few to list, whether it is in, you know, the world of film or even just, you know, our world of competition. But, you know, all those like Jackie Chan, Jet Li, Bruce Lee, you know, they're, they were all, in, you know, they're incredible people, you know, as, I mean, Jackie, fortunately, I know as a, as a friend. So that's one that I could say is just, you know, such a great human being, but yeah, I, I don't know, you know, it's, it's crazy that I don't even really think in those terms of like, God, who else would I want to train with? But, um, I don't know. I'm going to have to kind of <laughs> on the next interview, I'm going to have to come back at Fair you enough. with that one. Fair I, enough. I don't even really know. Cause like, really, like I said, anyone, like anyone who I could learn from or see kind of a new perspective, I would be interested in training with even kind of towards like the UFC and boxing and, and that, and even though, you know, I'm not a professional fighter on any level, like they are, I still enjoy boxing and doing that because I learn different little things as easy as like footwork and, you know, maneuvering around. And then I can take that into my stunt work. I could even take that into new little pieces of a form that I would build. So really anything where I could learn or progress or see someone's skill and then be, you know, kind of like at my level, but just in a different realm, I would be so honored to train with. Let me flip the question a little bit then. Yeah. Because you've trained with so many people, I'm sure mm -hmm. that, that there are people you've trained with that you learned a ton from that you said, you know, I just got so much out of working in, in this dojo or with this person or this stunt team. And then you've got the opposite people that, you know, you're sitting there going, Oh, how much longer am I here? What makes the difference for you between those that you're going to learn a lot from and those that you don't? Yeah. I mean, I think the only time I may not learn something per se, or yeah, I don't even want to say that because I don't want to ever come off, you know, sounding rude or like I, I can't learn, but there's maybe someone that's just the same, same, maybe same background as me who, you know, I've kind of been through that style and been through that, you know, um, skill set and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, everybody, everybody else that I could train from, I learned some, and even if it's not necessarily, you know, in a martial arts sense, like Mike Chap, for example, was, you know, one of my coaches, I was on XMA when that first, you know, came out. And, you know, he taught me a lot about performing. And I had already kind of established my, you know, martial arts and where I was at. And as, as always, I was a kid, there was lots to learn. But he really propelled me in the way I performed and the way the music resonated with the form and how that just sold my performance so much more. So I think even if it's not necessarily in a uh, karate, you know, form martial arts type thing, it could be in a mindset type thing, or, you know, as I just said, my chat and the performance side. So I really always believe that, that there's more that you could learn to make you better. Hmm. Well said. Let's talk a little bit about competition. This is the point where I usually ask guests if they've competed. Of course, we know that. We've heard a bit about that. We know <laughs> how fundamental that's been in your career and really the, the platform that's launched you into this kind of adult stage of your life, your career. But I want to go back. I want to, I want to talk. I want to know more about why competition resonated so much for you. What, what was it yeah. that you found in there that just made it your thing? You know, I think, and this coming from my dad and being a very competitive person and playing sports his whole life, I think that really, um, you know, obviously he's my dad. So <laughs> that came to me in the gene pool there. And I'm a very competitive person. And obviously as a kid, like you don't really, you know, you don't sit there, you know, as, at eight years old and say, Hey mom, Hey dad, I'm really competitive, you know, but it's just something I think in you that clicks that makes you want to do it more, which keeps you so, um, you know, excited about it. And I think that once I saw Nick Begley and the way he competed and, you know, going to tournaments and seeing him in that, in that spotlight, I was like, Oh, this is something that is really cool. 
you know, and it, it kind of gave me another goal in my martial arts. I just wasn't going for my next belt. Like I was going for that next tournament. So then when I saw him compete and example, he was on Paul Mitchell and I was like, Oh, you're on this team. That's like known as the best team in the world. Like, how did that happen? What did you do? And of course, in the karate school, I watch him train. I watch him, you know, go through his steps and, you know, how he prepares. And I think it just, I don't know, something about it was really attractive to me. And I think as I got older, I realized how competitive I was. Um, I remember being at some tournaments and if I ever got beat or if I saw like a new competitor come around, I was like, well, I have to do it better. I have to find a way there, there has to be a way that I could do it better or I could do something different to top that. Or there was just always things like that in my mind. And I think, you know, as a kid, it is hard. There are times when you're like, Oh, I want to go play. Like, Oh, I want to go to my friend's house, you know, but they're on the other side, you have to be in the gym. And I think my dad definitely helped with a lot of that because, you know, as, as an adult, especially now that I'm much older, I see, I see my students going through that with their parents. And I look back and I'm like, God, was I really this difficult? (laughs) Like call my dad up and be like, Hey dad, I'm sorry. Like, was I this hard? But, and I'm sure he would say yes, but I think that's just, that's life. You know, you go through the time of, of being a kid and wanting to do that. And I remember there were times when I struggled with that, but then I think when maybe it was like 14, 15 in my competing career, I really started winning. I really started dominating and I loved it. I was like, I, I'm, I need to stay on top. I need to keep training. I need to keep working. Um, I need to get better. And no matter who came at me, no matter what came at me, I just still was me. I still kept, like I said, to my basics. I still kept to what I believed in. And I mean, pretty much till the end of my career, I stood my ground with, with the way that I did things and the way I competed. And, you know, um, and I know that's hard because as times change, uh, you try to keep up with the time to, you know, fit in, I guess you could say with what's going on. And whether that meant more tricks in your form or more throwing your weapon in your form or more, whatever it was, I always just tried to stay me. And my dad always kept me as me. And if there ever was a time, he'd be like, remember what you do. Remember why you win. Remember what's gotten you to this point. And yeah, so I think between us two and like I say, him being competitive, me being competitive and him just helping me along my journey, it had always kept me motivated to just keep going to keep winning and to keep pushing let's talk about movies we don't have a whole lot of people on the show that have been in movies but those that have it doesn't seem like seem like this question has changed do you have a favorite martial arts movie you know that's so hard because again there there uh, there are a few amazing martial arts movies out there um you i mean i'm sure all my my viewers and followers by now will know where I'm going to stand in that. And I would have to say Jackie Chan has some of my best, you know, some of the best martial arts movies out there. Um, Not only because he is an amazing martial artist, but just his style and his, his, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just the way he comes off on screen is so fun and so energetic and it's so attractive to want to watch. And I've always kind of, you know, I've enjoyed that because it's fun. It's like an adventure when you're watching his movies. Um, And I mean, now that, of course, I've worked with him and seen the behind the scenes to what happens on the screen, you know, I do see how incredibly hard he works, how, how long he works. And he just, the guy honestly does not stop. And I admire him so much for that. And that's why sometimes when I'm having a crazy day, and I'm like, I'm like, just think about Jackie. Think about seeing the days that we were on set and he didn't even have time to eat. And, you know, he's running, trying to do this and trying to help this person. And, you know, it's, it was incredible to watch. And then just knowing, because I am, you know, I have maintained a relationship with him and I am very, you know, close friends with him at this point. 
Um, and he's just such an honorable and great person that he always cares about everybody that's around him. And it really is, you know, everyone says like, you know, the JC family, and it's, it's really a true statement. Like it is a family. We are one. He does care. It's not like he's just worried about his next movie or, you know, his next paycheck or his next, you know, it's like, he's just such a fantastic person that when you're around him, it's just like, you want to learn, you want to listen. And it's just, it's incredible. It's like, it's so hard to put fully into words, but it's amazing. (laughs) A very diplomatic answer. It it is. And you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, like Drunken Master, for example, an oh, amazing movie. Yeah, it's fantastic for you sure. You know, so there, there's a ton. And then you get more into like mainstream today. And it's like for his films, like Rush Hour, you know, because I'm speaking about Jackie per se and his movies, not necessarily the best martial arts movie ever out there. But, you know, everyone loves Rush Hour and everyone loves the clips at the end of him struggling to do all this stuff because it shows how real he is. It shows that he makes mistakes. It shows that, you know, just because you see it on a movie didn't mean it didn't take 10 tries and getting injured to do it. So for me and knowing, you know, knowing the martial arts side of it and all my years of training and then now being in the business and seeing how incredibly hard it is. And when I have to go through that now, I'm just like, wow, like my respect level for him is just like through the roof. So you're saying that when you do stunts, you don't pull them off the first time every time? (laughs) That's a good one. Um, Not always. There are times when I get them on the first try and they work. But you know what? It's not even just me. Like the camera guy could have missed the angle. The director may not have liked the angle. So even if you necessarily hit the stunt, it doesn't even matter because I mean, you got to do it again. There may, there's, there's a few factors that definitely go into it. So yes, normally it is not one and done. <laughs> <laughs> will, will we ever get Caitlin Duchelle outtakes? I mean, that, that's what everybody um, you know wants what? to know. Yes. And you know, what's funny is that like, sometimes I do like to post things. Like if I do get a really good, like fail video, I do like to post that. I've, I've posted one and I remember getting a ton of comments just being like, it's so nice to see like that you're real, that like you do mess up and you, you know, you do fall every so often. And, you know, I do get questions about that, you know, quite a bit because through my competitive years, I was known as always being the most consistent competitor. Um, And if I ever did make a mistake or a stumble, or I mean a drop of a weapon, which I think I've maybe done like two or three times ever in my career, it was shocking. People were like, what happened? Like, what's wrong? Like, did Caitlin Deschel just mess up? <laughs> and it's like, yes, we're all human. It happens. But I, of course, train to, to be that way. You have to be consistent in what you do. And it's the same here out, you know, in the stunt world. I may only have one opportunity to do something and I have to, I have to be able to do it. And, um, and martial arts has definitely helped me, you know, in that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough, definitely. But like I say, the, I think just all the training and through everything over the years, it's definitely helped me keep at that level to where, you know, I'm prepared regardless, but, um, the outtakes are, are funny to me. Like they're great. I posted a video the other day, actually with Nick Bateman, who's a martial artist who used to compete on NBL And I posted the funny, you know, or the serious video. And he posted the funny video of us kind of, you know, joking around and kind of losing our balance at the end and just laughing because, you know, that's how it is. That's the, you know, everything is not perfect all the time. And it's hard now, especially with social media, that the only thing that's ever put out there is is the perfect stuff. And everyone, you know, thinks that you're this perfect, you know, not flawed human being when that's not the case at all. Like we all have our imperfections. We all have our, you know, insecurities. And so that does exist. And I do like to show that to my fans that I do have that as well. Mm. And and I think that that's an admirable stance. We're seeing more and more that younger folks are coming up. People that have only known life with social media, only being exposed to 
these internet perfect individuals, you know, whether they be male or female, whether we're looking at models or actors or musicians and not seeing that there is another side of life, you know, a, a dirty, gritty, imperfect side. And I think it's great mm -hmm. that you're willing to share that side of who you are because that's all of us, whether we show it or not. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it is, it is a part of life. So to me, and it's funny, even when I go to follow people on, you know, on Instagram or whenever, you know, I, I look at their pages and if it all looks too fake and just kind of a persona that's put on to get the followers, I really have no interest in following them. Like I'd rather see someone sweating in a gym and you know what they eat and what they you know because then again for me I'm learning I'm like oh cool maybe I could incorporate that into my training or you know I could do this or that or you know whatever the case may be but it shows that they're real not just edited and touched up and photoshopped and you know put on the internet somewhere mm. exactly how about books or do you at all read martial arts books no, I really don't. I, it's sad. I don't really get to read at all. I actually have a book sitting on my table and it's about, um, it's, it's more for like the acting side of things. My acting coach, um, kind of got me into it and I have not read more than the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I literally have zero time and I'm like, Oh, well, when I got on a plane, like it'll be perfect. When I get on a plane, I'm so tired. Yeah. It's like my one moment I actually stop. So I crash. I go to sleep. So as bad as it sounds, I really don't read. No, no judgment. None at all. In fact, um, on the show, I've said so many times that books are not my way of consuming content that a friend of mine who runs another martial arts podcast put together the outline, came and did a whole episode on this show instead of his own show about martial arts books that people should read because I wasn't doing it. So we're, we're in good company here that you and I okay, are not, not God. reading the books. It's fine. Quite all right. <laughs> Let's talk about the future. Clearly we cool. know your career. We know what you're working on, but let's talk about the why. Mm -hmm. What are your goals? What are you striving for? All right. This is, this is a loaded one. Um, you know, I'm always striving for something, whether it's in, you know, the stunt career, my acting career. Um, and, I'm, and I'm always striving to do something to try to push forward. That's just how I am. Like, I can't just sit and just be like content with what I have, which I know may sound bad or, or wrong. Uh, not that I'm not thankful or blessed, but to me, there always has to be something you're pushing for next. So, I mean, in my stunt career, of course, right now, you know, I just finished, um, I guess I didn't just finish, but now that it's finally going to come out, I doubled Wonder Woman and, you know, I would, I would be honored to double her again, as much as I am trying to act and push that career forward, you know, being a female and being a martial artist and, being a part of this film with, with this group of women being gal as wonder woman, Patty Jenkins as our director. And it just being such a, a feminist type film. It's amazing because I push for that all the time, especially in my, in, in martial arts, you know, there were so many times when I was told like, you can't win or you can't do that as good as the boys. And I was like, huh, yeah, that's funny. Watch me. And that's kind of the mentality I started getting. Like I have to be just as good as the guys. So that made me train harder. And, and even now when I, when I see some of my girl students and they're like, I can't do that. I can't like, how am I going to beat the boys? I'm like, never say can't first of all, because I've beaten the boys, I've beaten the men and I have titles that a lot of them don't have and will never have. And I love to use that to inspire, you know, girls to, to get to that level and to be at their highest potential because there's some incredible talent out there. And to ever hear that, I'm just like, no, like, stop. That's the last time I want to hear those words come out of your mouth because you can do it. So 
Um, so, you know, back to like my, ind- the industry and my career, um, you know, I, I do want to take what I've done even further. And like I said, be an, uh, be an action actress and do my own stunts and show that, you know, I can get to that level and I could, you know, and it's a challenge for me. It is a, it's a huge challenge and, um, it really gives me something to work for on all levels. You know, my martial arts, my stunt have to be at such a high level. And then I have to get my acting to as high of a level. And so it's always giving me something to work on and progress, which I love because it keeps me busy. And I love to be busy. When my mom listens to this, she'll know because she's like, you need to relax. (laughs) And of course, you know, she's always trying to encourage me to do more and more and like I say, they're fantastic, but at some points they're like, you need to stop for a minute. And I'm just, I don't, I'm nonstop. I'm constantly going, doing something. Um, yeah. So I would say mostly just, you know, I love, you know, the whole, the acting side of the world. I love the stunt side of the world. And I still teach quite a bit, you know, like I said, I do have some students who still compete. So I teach privately, um, most of the time, I have actually, you know, actors that I train out here now who are in the business and want to, you know, maybe doing another, you know, film that requires them to be active or to have a fight scene. And they're like, hey, Caitlin, like, I need your help. Can can you help me? Can you train me? So um, I still love doing that. I, I will always give back to the martial arts and you know, to the people who have taught me to be like this, you know, because I know somewhere out there, someone's looking up to me saying, Oh, I want to do what she does. How, you know, and, and I know that's how I was as a kid. There were, you know, people that I looked up to and watching my instructor's son. And, you know, there's always someone that kind of moves you forward or pushes you or gives you that little bit of extra confidence. So if I ever can be, I always try to be that, whether it's for, you know, a girl, a boy, a, a woman, a man, like I, I try to be as inspirational and as, you know, helpful and giving as I can be. So that's, it's just truly what I enjoy. Enjoy. Let's, I'm going to scratch this. Just thinking of a transition. Mm, sure. Okay. All of that sounds great. And it's, it's really cool to see how, you know, you're just, you're, you're charging forward. You're not sitting back on your laurels as people say, And, you know, that's, that's what served you all the way up through now, for sure, you know, all all the way up through competition. So you're doing what's worked. And that makes sense. And I know how exhausting it can be, because that's how I've always done things as well. So I get it. And, Mm -hmm. and I just, I hope that if you do want to slow down, if you do want to take a break, that you give yourself permission to do that, because that's something that so few of us do. Definitely. Good. I definitely know it's healthy to relax. So, you know, just going home this past week and seeing my family and just kind of, you know, obviously, of course, I'm still working out and I'm still doing things because it's always a part of me and my life and my career. But I do definitely slow down, put my phone down, just kind of check out and relax because um, I do know that that's healthy. And I I know that it's definitely needed. If the people listening want to get a hold of you or find you on social media or on the web, you know, I know you're, you're in a bunch of places, but let us have it. Where can people find you? Yeah, of course. So I have, um, my Facebook, which is just Caitlin Deschell. Um, I have Instagram and Twitter, which is at Caitlin Deschell, all one word. And I pretty much, I want to say I use Instagram mostly. Um, I love pictures and I love videos and I love what it captures and I love the memories. So you'll find a lot of stuff on there of me just, and not just like I say, you know, me, you know, going to a tournament or me on a set, you'll see everything. You'll see my family, you'll see my dog, you'll see, you'll see me and you'll see my life, which is what I really love about it too. Um, And then I have my website, uh, CaitlinDeshell.com, which we keep pretty up to date with, you know, pictures and updates of where I'm going, you know, where you can find me, stuff like that. So yeah, pretty much those four, four outlets would be great. Cool. And of course, folks, we will link all of those over on the show notes. If you're new to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is where we drop all of those. I want to thank you for your time today. And maybe you could indulge us with one last little bit. How about some parting advice for everyone listening today? 
the best parting advice, you know, and of course I bring this, I think back to my martial arts is just, you know, never give up on what you're trying to do, whether, and, and that's in everything in life. I don't want to say just your career, but you know, family relationships, friends, um, it, it can be with your career, just never give up and just always keep striving for your goals because as unobtainable as they may seem sometimes, they're just in reach and you just have to take a second, you know, sit back, see what you can do to get there and then just go after it full force. And it, you can definitely do it. So just honestly, never give up. I love seeing passionate people succeed, especially when they're martial artists. I have no doubt that we're only scratching the surface of what her career will become. Thank you, Mr. Shell, for coming on the show. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes with a number of great photos, some video, links to all of her social media, and more. If you're not already a Caitlin DeShell fan, you will be. Find us on social media. We're everywhere, including the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. If you're not wearing a no-sweat tee right now, your life is incomplete. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but you really should check them out. Whistlekick.com is the place to go for those. Thanks for joining me today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.